Good morning and welcome to our presentation today. We'll be talking about deploying Windows Server 2016 um, with Microsoft Intel and Mellanox. Uh, my name is Mike Human. We're going to wait about 30 seconds for some additional people to join on and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So a couple of quick um, housekeeping items. Um, during the webinar, the audience will be on mute. Uh, we have a chat window that's open. You can send in questions that way. We will handle all the questions at the end of the presentation, so don't worry if we don't get to your question right away. We'll definitely address it. Leave it in the window, and we'll go through those at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll also open up live Q&A at that point in time if we have time to do so. For those of you on the social media side, you can see the hashtags that are here for the various speakers. Um, please feel free to use those. So speaking with us today, Klaus Jorgensen from Microsoft. Um, Klaus is, is kind of one of the uh, Microsoft experts on Windows Server 2016. We also have Vivek from Intel. Uh, he'll talk about Intel's um, SSD offerings, especially in the NVMe space and some of the things they're doing on the processor side to support HCI. We also have uh, Modi Beck from uh, Mellanox. Modi's going to talk about RDMA and how it fits into an overall HCI fabric. Uh, Howard Lowe uh, will be our final speaker. Howard Lowe is the VP of Sales and Marketing at Dayton, and he's going to talk about the EVGA case study and Dayton's offerings in this space. And my name is Mike Hewitt. I'm the uh, managing partner of G2M Communications. And I'll do a couple slides at the beginning and then kick it off over to uh, Klaus. Here's our agenda. Let's kind of skip through that real quick. We'll talk a little bit about HCI and what HCI is in the market. So the concept of HCI has been around for a while. Um, it's really taken off over the past four or five years. Um, for Intel-based servers, the idea is taking storage, computing, and networking and putting them together in a single physical package so it can be deployed easier, it can be managed easier, um, especially useful for things like branch offices and remote offices where you oftentimes don't have big IT staffs to uh, manage those devices. Uh, it certainly reduces the cost in deploying and managing devices like that into those environments. If you're wondering why it's a hot topic today, you can kind of see on the chart here of, of the expected growth of HCI, which includes both converged infrastructure and hyperconverged infrastructure. It's expected to grow from $2 billion in 2013 to about $8 billion in 2017. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing segments in the IT space. Um, it's actually even growing faster than cloud is. So it's, it's, it's a very hot topic. Every major IT hardware vendor out there today has an HCI solution, whether it's a Dell and Intel. Um, Lenovo, whoever the case may be. We're going to talk here about HCI specific to Windows, though, so that's where we'll go with that. So what makes HCI attractive and unattractive for specifically the mid-market, um, you know, think of, uh, you know, uh, medium-sized enterprises, things like that. Um, certainly most of those sorts of enterprises have small IT staffs, they oftentimes have to react quickly to changes in their IT needs. Um, if you can think about, say, a retailer, a small to medium retailer, as they come upon the holiday season, they may have to stand up compute resources quickly to deal with online business and things like that, and they want to be able to do it in, in an expeditious way so they don't lose sales. Some of the problems, though, with what I'm going to call conventional HCI solutions that are sold by the big guys is oftentimes they're very expensive. They oftentimes have large recurring costs or, or service charges, um, monthly recurring service charges that go with them. Oftentimes they're also large systems. Think of half rack or whole rack systems. Um, so you know you end up if you're a medium sized enterprise, looking at the values of it, you may lose all those between the capex and opex costs that you have to spend, and your overall re uh, re uh, realized savings may be minimal. 
So one of the things that's really important for medium-sized enterprises if they look at HCI is to try to find the right set of vendors to provide them an HCI solution. Uh, we're going to talk today about EVGA. EVGA is a leading graphics uh, card vendor and, and they're big in the uh, gaming world. Um, they're a typical mid-sized enterprise to them. Their compute infrastructure is a mission critical need. It's how they service their retail and uh, get drivers and things like that out to customers. They looked at HCI as something that could really simplify the management of their infrastructure. And when Howard talks a little bit about what their previous one is, you can see how some of those values come up. Um, after looking at a variety of solutions, they came to the idea that Dadon, Microsoft, Intel, and Mellanox really allow them to put out a high-performance solution that didn't break the bank, didn't have a lot of or large recurring costs, and really met their needs. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Klaus Jorgensen from Microsoft. He'll talk a little bit about Storage Spaces Direct. Klaus, take it away. Thank you. So as mentioned, my name is Klaus Jorgensen. I'm a Principal Program Manager in our Windows Server Development Organization. Uh, over the last many years, I've been working with our team on bringing Storage Spaces Direct to market. So let's first talk about what it is. So Store Spaces Direct is the enabler of bringing hyperconverged storage, meaning that we can now use servers with internal storage devices on the same machines where the hypervisor, Hyper-V, is running. Using these internal storage devices, we can create a highly available and scalable system by bringing together all the devices into a single storage pool and then carve out logical storage to, to the VMs. We are leveraging uh, NVMe devices uh, for better performance and efficiency. These devices significantly reduce the IO latency for storage. They significantly reduce the CPU consumption to service storage, et cetera. You can also use SATA devices to lower the cost of storage. In a hyperconverged system with storage, we're using the Ethernet network, optionally RDMA, as the storage fabric. So instead of having a shared physical storage fabric behind the servers, we're using the Ethernet fabric to basically communicate across the servers to bring together this storage pool and, and the logical disks. And Storage Spaces Direct is available with Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition. So, Let's go a little bit deeper in what kind of hardware configurations can be done. So the most common configuration is what are called the two tiers of physical storage. So you have a tier where you have some SSDs and some traditional hard drives. You can also have an all-flash configuration where you use NVMe SSDs plus traditional SSDs like SATA SSDs, where the NVMe SSDs functions as a cache and the SSDs are functioning as a capacity. Now, uniquely, we can also actually build a storage system that consists of three tiers of physical storage, where you have NVMe for caching, and then you have both uh, SATA SSDs as well as HDDs for additional tiering in the system, allowing you to put the coldest data out on the HDDs. In terms of network, we can use traditional Ethernet, which needs to be 10 gigabit or better, or we can leverage RDMA either in the form of iWarp or Rocky, which are two different RDMA technologies. RDMA provides uh, significant uh, advantages in a configuration like this because RDMA not only lowers the latency of the storage I.O. in the system, but also significantly reduces the pressure on the CPU to provide storage in the system for the overall gain of more IOPS in the system. Uh, we have seen very good numbers when you add RDMA to a system. So let's go through some of the feature highlights in Storage Spaces Direct. So the first thing is that we have a built-in always on cache. So that means we're taking the fastest devices in the system and use them as a write cache so that the so that the application can continue on uh, immediately after writing data. 
but also as a read cache for the most uh, frequently read data that may come from the slower devices so you can uh, have the workflow run faster. The cache configures itself automatically when you enable store spaces direct. The second portion is that we have a single pool of storage. So again, automatically, when you stand up store spaces direct on a system like this, we automatically pool all the available storage devices into a single pool so there is no manual need, uh, need for manual configuration or need for carving out multiple storage pools, etc. We can scale starting with two servers all the way up to 16 servers at, at this time. So very typically, you'll see deployments of either two, four, eight, 12, or 16 uh, node deployments. These servers can have a tremendous amount of storage, more than 400 drives. Actually, it's 26 drives per server for a total of 416 drives, providing petabytes of storage capacity in a fully scaled system. Now, many hyperconverged storage and many stores in general use mirroring as a technology for protecting data, and we do too. So if you need the absolutely best performance for your workload, you should use mirror for the resiliency of the data that you store in the system. However, for archival workloads and, and, and workloads with much lesser performance requirements, it is not uncommon to use a resiliency that is named parity. You probably know these today as called RAID 5 or RAID 6, protecting from single disk or dual disk failures. In systems like this, we have a technology called erasure coding. Erasure coding, the implementation that we have was uh, develop in collaboration with Azure. Now, erasure coding is very efficient in storing data so that you can drive storage efficiencies as 50% or higher compared to three copies mirror, which is always 33%. Now, the challenge with erasure coding is that the right performance in these uh, is relatively penalized by the fact that you have to calculate these erasure codes at the time you write the data. So what we have done is we have essentially accelerated the writing into erasure codes by fronting the erasure codes with a set of mirror, so when the application writes data, it lands in the mirror, and then subsequently we move it out into the erasure code uh, area lazily. Now, so there are various workloads that can be used with store spaces direct, right? So the first one is the one where we actually store, uh, use it as a scale-out file server. Now, why would you use it as a scale-out file server? That's for the deployments where you have multiple Hyper-V machines that are running outside, as in not in a hyper configuration, but you can have Hyper-V servers or Hyper-V clusters that are all going to this scale-out file server system that is built on stored spaces to that. This is very common in large-scale deployment where you need to scale your compute resources and storage resources independently. What we're talking about today is a hyperconverged deployment where the VMs are running actively on the same set of machines that is also providing the storage to the system. So that's the hyperconverged. That's the most common deployment. Now, we actually also support running uh, SQL Server natively on top of storage spaces directly. So providing a tremendous amount of IOPS and, uh, and, and throughput for SQL database uh, operations, whether it's OLTP or, or data warehouse applications. So to recap, Store Spaces Direct is using servers with internal storage similar to uh, the servers we're using in Azure and other cloud providers are using. No need for a shared physical infrastructure behind the servers. It is highly available and scalable, provide redundancy to multiple failures, so you can have a server fail or drive fail, et cetera. We're leveraging uh, NVMe drives for best possible performance, as well as efficiency in that we don't consume as much CPU when doing this, leaving more, especially in hyperconverged deployments, is this important because the less CPU that is consumed by the infrastructure, the more CPU you have to your active workloads. 
Same with satellite devices for reducing the cost in the system, and then we can use Ethernet and RDMA network as a storage fabric. To give you an idea of this whole CPU thing, even in the highest benchmarks that we have shown, running massive amount of VMs, running a massive amount of IOPS, the infrastructure itself really never exceeds 10% of the actual CPU consumption in these systems. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's available in the, in the data center edition of Windows Server 2016, which is available now. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Loss. Um, I'm Vivek, uh, Vivek Sarathy from uh, Intel's um, NVM group, uh, focused on data center SSDs. Uh, my my focus has been on different software defined storage technologies uh, recommending uh, end users on uh, what technology fits in fits in their need uh, so what what I'm going to do in today's presentation uh, is going to give you an overview of uh, where we think uh, the storage technology as a whole is going towards uh, and uh, what we think is the future going to be uh, and we have done some um, testing with uh, Storage Spaces Direct, uh, show you some performance numbers that we see uh, and go from there, okay? Awesome, uh, so let's get started. Um, so one of the key things that, that we see uh, in the storage technology uh, that's, that's transforming the storage as a whole is uh, the cloud, uh, different architectures that's coming from uh, in implementing, you know, uh, a private cloud or or a public cloud, uh, that's your next generation architecture that goes in. Uh, the third one that we're looking at uh, is the transformation in the storage media, right? Um, right from hard disk to uh, SSDs, whether it's a SaaS or a SATA, or and then uh, the NVMe uh, technology that we have currently, right? So a uh, huge transformation. Uh, there's a big transformation that's going on in uh, in the storage um, uh, ecosystem as a whole. So one of the key um, challenges that uh, IT industry, right, uh, IT data center industry is looking at today uh, is how do we manage the the cost of implementing implementing a data center infrastructure, right? Um, there's been a lot of budget cuts. Uh, how do we how do we manage that? Where do we spend the money in uh, so that we get the right resource and also make sure that we we support the data growth that's happening. Uh, the other aspect, uh, the other uh, challenge that uh, data center is looking at today uh, is the performance. Uh, everybody wants data as soon as they click a button. They don't want to wait for uh, two minutes before they get the get the final result. So uh, how do we remove the bottleneck and make sure that the performance matches matches the need, right? And the third one is the complexity. You have a huge amount of data that's getting generated um, right from your uh, IoT, right from your, say, your cell phone, your laptops, and, and a whole bunch of other things, right? Um, so how do you manage this data that's getting generated? Where do you store it and uh, make sure that it's not too complex? Uh, you have a single ecosystem where everything comes under a single umbrella, right? So to to solve those problems, to solve the top three problems that we're looking at, right? Uh, the way the uh, industry is responding to that is moving from your traditional architecture, where you have your scale-up architecture. Uh, let's say your traditional uh, SAN environment, right? You have you have a storage uh, ecosystem separate. You have your servers uh, that's separate, and then you have your switches in the middle, which which acts as an interface. Very complex. Each one has its own uh, interface to to manage with. Um, and what what the data center is, is looking at, uh, you know, what the ID experts are looking at is moving towards hyperconverts, where you have both your storage and compute in the same node, uh, have a single uh, single management utility where you can manage the entire ecosystem in in one go, right? So that it makes it easier for them overall. 
So uh, Klaus gave a very good explanation on Storage Spaces Direct, uh, one of the key features that's there in Windows Server 2016, right? Uh, perfectly fits for your uh, hyperconverged architecture, uh, where it, uh, and also is managed by by a single interface. makes it makes it much easy, right? So I don't want to go too detail into it, uh, given Klaus's uh, Klaus has given a very good explanation on it, right? So. What we ended up doing uh, is uh, Intel worked with Microsoft uh, in coming up with uh, three different uh, recommended configurations that we think fits for different customer workloads, right? One is your um, IOPS optimized. If, if a customer is looking at a hyper-converged architecture or if a customer is looking at a software-defined uh, storage solution, uh, that where the, where the key aspect is, uh, is more on the performance, where they want the best performance coming out, uh, we, we we recommended an option of go towards an all NVMe configuration where you have NVMe as the caching as well as the capacity tier, right? And then we had uh, the throughput and the capacity optimized configuration uh, where you have the uh, NVMe SSDs as the as the caching device uh, and SATA as your as your capacity, so that you have a, a balanced performance uh, right from your capacity as well as your your performance, right? And the third one is the capacity optimized, uh, where we had uh, NVMe as a as a caching tier and hard disk as a capacity tier, right? So that we could fill uh, all the three all the three buckets uh, depending on what the customer workload is and how do they want to implement. It. So one thing that you see in these three configurations is NVMe on on all of them, right? Uh, so. For people who are not familiar with the NVMe technology, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an overview of, of the technology, show you some performance numbers, um, and, and hopefully that, that helps you in seeing the advantage of using uh, the NVMe device, right? So what NVMe is, is nothing but a standard on the for the PCIe Express. Uh, there's, there's a community that's working on it. Uh, it's been architected from ground up. Uh, so that the next generation uh, future products um, does not have the same bottleneck as the previous generation that that we had, right? Uh, what it helps is it eliminates the uh, the storage um, controller that you have in the middle when you connect it to um, say a hard disk or or a SATA or a SAS SSD, right? Um, it's it's a big community. Uh, you have 80 plus companies uh, supporting it. Uh, and there are 13 companies uh, in the board of directors uh, in the in the ecosystem uh, who decide on what, uh, how does this technology need to move forward, and what's the best path uh, going in it, right? So, uh, from a performance perspective, uh, if you look at just just the random uh, random uh, 4K read IOPS, what you see is around 450K um, on the NVMe. Uh, compared to a 130k on a SAS uh, or a 75k on a SATA, right? Excellent performance, a uh, huge increase in uh, in the overall performance that you're looking at uh, when you compare it to a SAS or a SATA-based uh, SSD, right? From an IOPS perspective, uh, from an IOPS latency perspective, right? Uh, what you see uh, is around 0.25x. Uh, decrease in the latency, so you have a much faster device, uh, and at the same time, you have a 2x increase in the overall IOPS when you compare it with a SAS-based uh, SAS SSD, right? Much better performance in the IOPS as well as in the latency aspect of things. And from a QoS perspective, uh, what you see is around uh, 16 microsecond on an average and a 35 microsecond on a 99.9 interface latency, right? Um, when you compare that to a SAS or a SATA-based uh, SSD, uh, the scale is around uh, 100, 100 seconds of 100s of microseconds, right? Big difference, big difference right from your uh, your QoS latency and IOPS perspective, okay? So uh, what does this translate? What does this translate to the overall uh, storage spaces direct solution and and uh, and how does this fit into the three configurations that we had recommended, right? So um, I'm going to go over the results uh, so that you can get a better perspective on how does uh, the the NVMe device device help it, right? If you look at if you look at the capacity optimized configuration that we recommended, 
uh, you have the NVMe as the caching and hard disk as a capacity, right? If the working set or if your active working set is going to stay within the uh, within the NVMe device, uh, you have around uh, 950k IOPS, uh, which is good uh, as long as you know that your working set is not going to grow uh, and it's going to stay within your your caching limit. Uh, if the working set grows, uh, then you have a pretty significant hit, uh, which is not suitable for uh, for your growing uh, uh, growing ecosystem or your growing, uh, say, your application. Right? It's it's a good it's a good play for uh, cold storage. Uh, if you're going to uh, if you're going to know what your working set is going to be, and you see no increase in uh, in in the future uh, future implementation. Right? So from uh, the next configuration is your uh, NVMe uh, SSD as a caching and uh, SATA as your uh, capacity, right? An all flash configuration. Uh, what we saw in this was if your working set is within your uh, with, within your uh, caching device, which is your NVMe, you're looking at around 1.5 million IOPS uh, on a four node cluster, very impressive. Uh, and if your working set grows and if it goes to uh, uh to your capacity tier right uh, what we see is around 1.2 million iops again very impressive uh good for growing working set and that tells you why you know uh, the future technology and people who are implementing products currently are looking at all flash right uh, helps in helps in making sure the uh, there's no effect on the performance when uh, when when your database is growing or when your active set is uh, is is migrating from your cache to your capacity okay the third one uh, is your uh, all nvme uh, what we saw with an all nvme configuration is around 3 million iops on a four node cluster excellent performance uh, perfectly fits for people who are looking at uh, 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 deploying uh, an architecture that's specific for uh, IOPS uh, intensive uh, workloads or uh, with latency is the key aspect uh, in, in the overall application, right? I uh, think this is, uh, this fits in uh, very well given given the price point of uh, NVMe devices are going down and, and on par with SATA devices now. Uh, looking at implementing an all NVMe uh, fits the customer needs on a, on a longer strategy, right? <clears throat> awesome. So uh, I'm going to let uh, Modi from Melnox uh, take it from here and, and uh, explain to you more on the networking aspect of things. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, it's uh, Moti from Melanox. I'm part of the market development team at Melanox. And as uh, Vivek said, I'm going to give some details about the importance of using the right networking technology to get the highest efficiency in this de specific deployment. So before actually going into the details, just a couple of words about Melanox. I'm pretty sure that all of you know very well about who are uh, Microsoft and, uh, of course, Intel. <coughs> but uh, Melanox is a, a, a company that focuses and provides only networking solution everything that you need from PCI Express to PCI Express. And our solution includes all the components, including the spectrum, the latest uh, switch that we have that can support all the Ethernet standard speeds that runs from 10, 25, 40, 50, and 100 gigabit per second. NIX at the same speed. LinkX at the cables, whether they are K optical or copper or silicon photonics and software that helps you, like the new, that helps you to manage the networking, and the Melanox OS that helps you to manage the, or to the operating system on the switch itself. But uh, all of our products are open, so if you want to use your own operating system, we have an SDK that helps you to do it. So about the need for highest uh, performance, basically about uh, couple, more than a couple of years ago, uh, we already identified the need the, for higher than 10 gigi and actually higher networking performance. At that time, it was the 10 
one LAN over uh, 10 gig per second, and if you wanted to use uh, four, um, higher, then you could use the 40 gig over uh, four lanes. And then the next one, according to the IEEE, was to move to the 100 that was uh, 4 of 25. And we proposed actually to the IEEE at the time to also standardize the 25 and the 50 and to make it, uh, uh, since we actually uh, saw that the 10 is not going to be enough, mostly, by the way, because uh, the, the speed that the NVMe drive or SSDs that Vivek uh, talked about requires. So we proposed it to the IEEE uh, to standardize the 25 and 50, like uh, as the next generation of the 10. At the beginning, the IEEE didn't want to do it so fast. We worked with industry partners like Google, Microsoft, and eventually the IEEE also accepted it as a standard. So today, in addition to the 10 and 40, we have also the 25 and 50 and 100 as a standard. So, uh, but speed is just one element of higher, getting higher efficiency. The other element, if you are choosing the right network, is to choose a network that has what we call offload engine. And one of the offload engine is the RDMA, and I believe that Klaus already mentioned it in his presentation. And this is a very simple illustration that shows why RDMA is so much effective or more efficient than the TCP IP. If the TCP IP is, user, is using the CPU to run the every stack, the, the TCP IP stack, and there are multiple copies, and the operating system is really heavily involved. The RDMA is very simple mechanism. Usually the CPU tells the I.O. controller, move this block from this server to the other and tell me where you, when you are done. And everything is done on the controller itself. The I.O. controller offloads it from the, the CPU so the CPU has much more cycles to run the application itself, and the overall efficiency of the system is, is higher. And just as an example, uh, to, to illustrate uh, the, the performance gains that you can get uh, with Rocky, and there are a couple of standards that are used, industry standards that are using uh, RDMA. One of them is the InfiniBand that, uh, on the high-performance computing, and the other one is Rocky, which is RDMA over converged Ethernet. It basically allows you higher throughput, lower latency, and much lower CPU utilization. I would say CPU, I would call it actually over it. So using the RDMA or the, in general, offload engines that are on the I.O. controller compared to running it on the CPU and freeze more cycles to, from the CPU to run the application itself, of course, it. Uh, uh, it results in higher uh, overall efficiency. And about, I believe, a year ago, at, at, uh, I would say even before, and, and this is actually what uh, Microsoft uh, saw a while back and started to use the RDMA technology in the previous generation uh, of Windows Server, at Windows Server 2012, when they started and uh, improved the SMB 3.0 to run over RDMA, what they call a, a, a SMB Direct, and actually shows that once you are using RDMA, or specifically Rocky, you can cut the overall cost per gigabyte by 50%. Not just by using one network instead of two of them. If in the past you had to use the Ethernet and the fiber channel, and now you can use only one fi uh, Ethernet type, which is the Ethernet, but also because the RDMA gives you uh, the same or better performance compared to the fiber channel at the time. And at the time, it was just supporting for a scale-out file system, but the efficiency is pretty, is pretty clear. In 2016, uh, Windows Server 2016, in addition to the scale-out file uh, system, Microsoft uh, also included the uh, hyper-converged, uh, and uh, Klaus already mentioned it, and, uh, which is RDMA is very important parameter of it. Uh, again, everything is about getting the data faster from the node, the right node to the right uh, uh, VM in the system. And uh, 
just, uh, you know, a benchmark that can illustrate it. It was done about a year ago at Ignite when uh, Microsoft connected two servers together, very simple configuration, running over, in this particular case, it was 100 uh, gigabit per second, compared the results of with RDMA or without RDMA, and they allocated just specific numbers of cores to run the TCP IP protocol. Otherwise, if you give the entire CPU, of course, um, not much will be left to run the application itself. And comparing the results, uh, uh, they got about 50% uh, faster when you ran uh, over Rocky, about 91, pretty much the wire speed compared to 54 or 56 when you're running over TCP IP. So the reason is, uh, when, when digging a little bit into the reasons, is that when we compared why it, was, it got only 55 or 56 gigabit per second, pretty much when you ran the, C, the TCP IP on the allocated cores to run the protocol, the TCP IP protocol, all cores were fully utilized, so it was a CPU bounded from this particular point of view, while on the Rocky itself, all the cores were uh, very little utilized, pretty much giving higher efficiency. And uh, this is actually, a, you know, a why we believe that once you are deploying a Windows Server 2016, you know, this is the, you need to choose the right networking technology, not that it's not going to work over TCP IP, but of course over a higher performance, lower latency, it's going to be a much more efficient solution. So this concludes my presentation, and I'll uh, give the mic to our. Thank you, Moti. Thank you, Vivek. And thank you to Klaus. Uh, we have heard of all the industry-leading technology vendor that has kind of articulated to you their technology and how everything comes together and providing the best of breed solution. And for those who doesn't know data on, uh, we're a storage vendor and uh, we'll really position ourselves as the vendor that help you deliver this complete integrated solution, working with Microsoft, working with Intel, with MVME, leveraging uh, uh, Mellanox and their RDMA networking to build you a complete solution that's deployable, certified, engineered, optimized, able to help you give you that entire platform deployed into your infrastructure and your system. Uh, as a company, we've been around for about 30 plus years. Uh, we believe that we have all the experience for the last 10 plus years and last five years really working with Microsoft and deploy the Microsoft solution based on software-defined storage. With the introduction of hyperconvergence, Windows 2016, we see the opportunity tremendously both for shared storage and hyperconverged storage by Microsoft and able to leverage all the technology and platform into one piece turnkey to you as an end user is quite important and where you could come to us without all that solution. So quickly, you know, um, you know, we believe the opportunity for software-defined storage uh, with Windows is tremendous. Uh, just our company, we have over 500 unique customer deployment on storage spaces alone. And in addition to that, we added more and more customers the second half of the year, and we have over five proof of concept and deployment on Windows 16 hyperconverged already happening. So this particular um, trajectory and momentum is happening, and we continue to see customers shift from their traditional storage deployment into software-defined storage, and really choosing Windows as really the, 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 the solution of choice. Ultimately, Window, making that decision that I believe Windows Storage Server with all the feature, enterprise feature they have put in, integrating MVM from Intel and Mellanox is the right solution for you. And all the customer has been proven that it is the right solution and they're deploying it today. And at data on, and our goal is continue to share those use cases with you. When, when customer calls us, we share the experience we have with you, how to deploy it, how to integrate it, what kind of performance you get to make sure that fits your requirement. And if you go to our website today, you'll see all the case uh, uh, white paper, all the use case study that we have done in the last five years running storage spaces to share with you the experience of other customers. Uh, we ignite, uh, we uh, announced a lot of exciting news at Ignite uh, a couple uh, a month back, 
And with Windows 16, we also announced our first product of um, hyperconverged cluster appliance, S2D3110. This is a all NVMe flash appliance well, with a VEC uh, categorized as really IOP optimized. We have multiple solutions I'll share with you a little bit later. But we announced that and we're actually now deploying that into the marketplace today. In addition, you'll, you'll see a, a snapshot of our software management platform really provide visibility and management for Windows environments, which is quite important as you deploy Windows. And lastly, we have many products that still continue to project forward with Windows 16 and running a Windows Server platform. Being certified is very, very critical. So as you choose your Windows platform, make sure it's on a certification catalog. All our products are certified 2016 and 2012 R2. So make sure you choose those and find the right product for yourself and we're there too. EVJ was a very unique customer. He's been a customer for a long time and they've been a SAN customer uh, running uh, three-part, uh, uh, actually, uh, NetApp. And when they came to us, prior to GA of Microsoft, they really wanted to really embrace the bleeding edge technology and really deploy a hyper-converged platform using Windows 16. And what we did is we really worked with them and really designed a platform that fits their requirement in, in, in an all-flash NVMe system using both Mellanox switches and Intel MME and running Windows 16. And today, we're in the process of deploying, and they're now migrating out their workload into it, whether or not SQL workload, uh, Windows workload. They have their uh, enterprise application running Hyper-V on top, and they essentially get to do storage replica. All of these are features that's inbox in Windows 16, which is very unique because by being a Windows shop, you have all these features ready, and you need to find the right company and platform to help you deploy it, and Data On is a company that helped EVGA deploy that platform. And in that process, they're able to leverage all the features of Windows 16. They're able to use the latest technology of NVMe in that system. And in our test, in the real deployment test at EVGA, we're able to get 2.4 million IOPS of performance. This is unheard of in a 4 node system. Vivek did better than us. He got 3 million in his lab. But this is real-world deployment that we have at EVG at a customer running Intel, Windows, and Mellanox at 2.4 million IOPS. And as, as close partners, we also work with them to deploy their switch technology to leverage RDMA running Mellanox. So able to bring all these technology pieces together into an integrated solution, turnkey solution, deployable support, provide warranty for the customer so the customer knows that what they're getting is all certified. It's very important in the real world, and that's what they don't do to provide that solution. And EVJ is one of the case study that we have. You could download that today on our website on the link. We actually gonna have a white paper come out that shows the deployment, how we did it, the step-by-step -step process, which you guys could use as a reference moving forward. So data on as a Microsoft platform really have a very Microsoft focused software defined strategy was really focusing on how do we get the best product for our customer with choices selection for Windows 16 shared storage and hyperconverge. And you'll see on this chart, we have multiple product line that fits into the category of your requirement. It's upon us and working with you guys as end users to develop that solution that fits you. And whether or not that's um, Azure ready, whether or not it's software defined, whether or not it's really having a management platform like Must that runs it, we want to make sure we have a solution that fits you and able to manage your infrastructure so you have the peace of mind that there's a company working with you deploying Windows-based storage solution. As part of that, you'll see that we have multiple products that's already been tested, certified, ready to deploy in the marketplace. And you'll get, you could get these slides later, and you'll see that our 3110 is a 1U all NVMe SSD solution for IOP optimized. So you could deploy in four nodes. We have our other product that's capacity optimized. We have product that's 2U appliance or four nodes, all uh, non share, that you could deploy. In the 2U form factor, you could deploy S2D. So we want to make sure we have the choice for you as a customer to deploy hyperconverged, whether or not in a converge or hyperconverged deployment configuration. And you will, you could download all the case studies, all the solutions based on for these products, so you can review them as you require. In addition to that, you'll see that we have very, very concise deployment configuration model. We want to make sure we share with you how you should deploy it, 
what kind of configuration, how are the disks utilized, what kind of network you need to use. All these are very critical in your decision process to make sure you can integrate into it. At the same time, we continue to bring our CID, which is our flagship product, Windows 2012 R2, into 2016. You can deploy multiple type of CID into the marketplace, cluster in a box for shared storage. In a, in a 2U, 4U form factor, you could get shared storage running Hyper-V and Scale File Server in that process. And we have a lot of information you could share, and you could go look in our website today. In addition to that, uh, as part of capacity play for Windows storage, you have JBots, right? And these are uh, JBots that we also been pushing for the last five years, which you have 2U24 Bay, 32 Bay, 70 Bay JBots that you could deploy in the marketplace for multiple applications. It could be nearline storage, production storage, or archive for backup. Based on your requirement, you have the ability to run Windows storage server, Windows server storage on all these platforms for your requirement as an IT organization. And most importantly, uh, with the 2016, Datan also introduced our management utility software platform for visibility and infrastructure management called MUST. MUST is really a integrated set of software that sits on top of Windows, and really using Windows Health API and all the features that are provided by Windows Server and provide you a visibility into your Windows storage. So when you deploy it, you have SAN-like experience, really ability to see the, the drives, the IOPS, the latency in a single pint of glass, in a GUI, so you can manage your platform on Windows, which today you could do with System Center, but in the smaller deployment, window deployment with data on, you have all these as part of your offering. So we're very excited about Must, and that will be available towards the end of the year, early next year for all our customers. As you see, we have a complete portfolio at Data On that is certified and provides choices for our customer, whether or not you're JBot, CIB, S2D, software-defined servers, all these features, all the requirements from Microsoft to make sure you have the right choice to deploy a Windows Storage Space solution. Data On, as the Microsoft certified platform, we continue to commit ourselves to our technology partner, Microsoft, Intel, and Mellanox, to make sure that we have a turnkey solution, a complete solution that integrates everything, and we could deploy that into your environment. Our goal is continue to go down the path from 2012 to today, and moving forward to next year as Azure comes out. And we're very excited to continue that journey and continue to bring the best of breed technology to our customers. And that's a, that's a completion uh, in, uh, to uh, our presentation. And now we're going to open for a panel questions. Uh, mm. Feel free if you have any questions and send it to us. And Mike, here you go. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, everybody, for your presentations. Hopefully that was very uh, informative for the audience. We have a couple questions that we had sent in earlier by email. Let me uh, read these off and get some answers from the, from the panel. So the first one was to Klaus Jorgensen of Microsoft. And that question is, what are the advantages or some of the advantages of storage spaces direct in Windows 2016 over the storage capabilities that were in, that were in Windows 2012 R2? I think that's a great question. So let's first talk about then what the Windows Server 2012 R2 could do. So storage spaces in 2012 required you to use what we in data speak call a shared J block. What that means is that the JBot that needs to be physically connected to all the servers that make up this, the, the storage system or the, 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 uh, the solution. So it's, it's common for these JBots to have two or four interfaces, which means that in order to connect it to every single one, you can effectively scale only to four servers in a deployment. And as you see from the presentation I gave, at, even from the get-go, we support up to 16 servers uh, for scale. So that's moving the scale point much higher than we could with, with, with storage spaces in terms of number of servers uh, that participate. The second part is that the shared JBot is connected via a technology that's called SAS. SAS is a, is a, is a, includes a cabling technology that has a distance limitation of five meters which in the U.S. will probably be around 18, 19 feet. Um, that makes it very challenging to create stored solutions where the servers are placed in different racks for rack fault tolerance and stuff like that. So that's another advantage of going down this direction. The third piece, and probably the, one of the most important pieces, is that 
in a shared infrastructure, you need drives that support a shared infrastructure. And today, that means effectively you need to use SAS drives. Um, it me that means you can't use SATA drives. It also means you can't do devices like NVMe. It would also mean that you can't use uh, upcoming devices like persistent memory uh, in these types of systems. So it allows for greater flexibility in, in, in using these storage technologies that are not inherently shareable. And that ultimately gives us the ability to run Windows Server 2016 stores on the same class and type of hardware that is being leveraged inside the public cloud. So all the investments that the hardware vendors are doing to support the public cloud, we can benefit from in, in these types of configurations. So it sounds like, I, I guess to summarize what you said, that it's really opened up the capabilities of scale and get much better performance than you could get out of Windows Server 2012. That's right. We did a great. I think we did a great job in Windows Server 2012. There's lots of people happy, but this is about keep moving, keep moving. Absolutely. Thank you very much. The next question, speaking of networking, was for Madi from Mellanox. So Madi, one one of the questions that came in was, does RDMA require special Ethernet switches to function properly? Yeah, actually, it's a great question, and thanks for uh, whoever uh, asked it. And, and this is to clarify uh, that there is no special need on any switch uh, from the networking point of view. The, the thing that uh, is so strong about the Rocky itself is that it can use the same infrastructure, the same management of the Internet itself, and customers to, or users today can use actually the same NIC in our case to run on the same port, uh, Ethernet or Rocky traffic, uh, uh, not at the same time, but uh, without any modifications. And this is a feature, I believe, that uh, uh, Microsoft added into Windows Server 2016, that the same port can run those two traffics, and there is no extra effort that uh, uh, the user needs to do. So, but from the other side, if you are using the network, uh, you, you have two choices. Uh, for running the uh, Ethernet or the Rocky, you can, uh, you, you need sometimes, or you want to sometimes to have a, a reliable network. In this particular case, you can work with a setup or a, the priority flow control mechanism that was in the switches since the FCOE uh, was uh, standardized, or there are other mechanisms that you can use to use this mechanism or uh, ECN that you can use. But practically, there is no need, there is no extra cost uh, to add uh, and to, uh, to work over a uh, Rocky uh, while getting the highest performance and the highest efficiency. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think that, that probably clarified RDMA and Rocky requirements for a lot of the people that are out there. One of the other questions we got, this one is for Vivek at Intel. So um, one of our uh, respondents asked, why should they buy enterprise-grade SSDs instead of buying consumer-grade SSDs? Are there things you get out of an enterprise-grade SSD that are, that are unique and kind of justify that added cost? Sure, sure, yeah. So that the solutions that, that you're looking at here is – uh, data center based solutions right it's not uh, it's not something that that mostly you don't end up keeping at home and and use it as a personal use right uh, so from an SSD perspective uh, and from specifically to an Intel SSD data center uh, SSD perspective right um, one of the key benefits that you get is the data integrity uh, mechanism that's built into it um, what that does is if there's uh, if there's an undetected error that's that's coming up from the layer above the SSD, uh, the uh, the mechanism in uh, in the in the device uh, helps helps figure out that okay something is not right and uh, we need to resend the data. Uh, that's that's a very key feature in data centers where you don't want to have uh, a wrong data sitting inside your storage device, right? And other aspect is uh, the annual fa uh, failure rate. Um, it, 
there's a very low failure rate uh, specific to Intel uh, data center SSDs, um, and that uh, that's that's a key aspect in any uh, any data center environment, right? Uh, I'd say the third aspect is the endurance uh, and the performance. Uh, the endurance um, and the performance of these devices are, are more focused towards uh, the data center environment, and uh, there's a reason why why we classify it, right? Um, and uh, if you deploy these uh, these solutions, I think the right uh, way to deploy it is using data center products and not um, off the shelf or uh, or uh, any any product that's outside the data center realm, right? So it sounds like if if one were to, to try to deploy consumer grade SSDs into their um, enterprise system, what they're probably going to see is devices wear out quickly and perhaps don't have the performance that they really need to optimize their uh, their deployment. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What, uh, what, we have one more question that came in uh, on email. This one is for Howard. Um, one, of, one of our respondents said, hey, if I've already got servers, can't I just put Windows 2016 on those existing servers and kind of get the same benefits that EVGA got? Yeah, you know, uh, one of the key things is able to uh, run commodity server, and you could, uh, but ultimately, uh, as I alluded earlier, uh, data uh, as a... Uh, a storage a system vendor, we really try to bring the best of breed technology into it and make sure you have a peace of mind of certification, validation, performance tuning, and support, right? Having to able to integrate all the key technology feature and able to deploy a complete turnkey solution that we can stand behind and our technology partners stand behind is quite important because ultimately you want a platform that runs well and able to be the best tuned performance solution for you but ability to understand all the technology aspect, able to deploy a solution that really fits your requirement, really require an expert like Data On who's been living and breathing technology and Microsoft for the last 10 years. And we believe we've delivered the best solution for you as a customer so you can have the best experience and able to make sure you have a reliability resiliency in your data center, which is mission critical to your data. So if you want that 2.4 to 3 million IOPS, and you want to get it without having lots of headaches trying to get there. It sounds like buy, buying a built system that's already ready to go is the right answer. Oh, you have a single point of person to choke, and the person to choke is data on. There you you come to data on any time for all, all your needs, and we're here to help you. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. If you have questions you think of after the presentation, feel free to send them to the uh, contact info that you saw on the, on the uh, social media slide. We'll be happy to answer them and get them back to you. And uh, thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you.